Welcome to the event formerly known as Opening Day. We are now calling it Convocation. Um, convocation derives from the Latin con, with or together, voca, to call, shun, and action. So it's the act of calling together, right? And this has a rich history in academic circles where the governing body of the college would convene for the sake of speaking on the important matters of the college. And so, since we are a shared governance, we collectively are the governing body and we are convened today to talk about important matters pertaining to the college. Coming to the college with fresh eyes, some of the things I've been seeing have been quite extra, meaning out of the ordinary. Faculty and staff, talented, committed, experienced, devoted to our students, and willing to work together for a new ECC. We also have an extraordinary responsibility. So I've been spending time with Marvin Wilson and the Men of Merit, and it is clear to me that we are a pivot institution. We transform the lives of individuals, their families, and their communities. This is a huge responsibility. And I think that we are at a very opportune time in terms of the history of Western New York, that we are part of this great renaissance and that our students have the opportunity to participate in and benefit from this revival, this resurgence and this renaissance. As, import as importantly as jobs is the optimism that comes with this renewal. Incompetence. <laughs> so in contrast to my initial impressions of the college, um, people have given me their unsolicited opinion about the college. Incompetence actually means an inability to compete with maybe the 20 other institutions of higher ed in Western New York. And so the contrast between my impressions and what people were saying about the college made me think, why are people saying that the people at the college are incompetent? Misattribution. I think a common misattribution made of communities without resources is that what you're seeing is a function of something permanent in the individuals that comprise the community, rather than the environment or the conditions in which they live. I think something else is going on. As a clinical psychologist, there's a psychological mechanism in which when we have undesired feelings, difficult feelings, we tend to project, which is to throw forward, those undesirable or uncomfortable feelings. So we all have incompetence in all of us, but instead of owning up to it, it provides a psychological relief to project that onto a convenient target. And I think the college has served as a convenient target for people's uncomfortable feelings of incompetence. Impression, two meanings, pressed in as from repetition, an idea, feeling, or opinion about something or someone formed without conscious thought or on the basis of little evidence. So, what are some of the negative associations you've heard about the college? Anyone just... 
DCC at Easy Credit College, and that's one of the reasons we're changing the logo. Obviously, the, the ECC becomes a convenient way to denigrate the college. Anything else? Other negative? My friend's son cried in the parking lot because he thought that ECC was the only place he could go. Any other negative associations that you hear from our community? What's that? Glorified high school? Right. Anything else? Extra Chiktopaga Central. <laughs> So these impressions, these negative associations with the college impact us. They impact us in a very negative way. Students don't want to come here. Students are crying in the parking lot thinking they have no choice but to come here, <laughs> right? And they don't want to come here for two reasons. One, who wants to go to a school with bad service, right? Outdated offerings, right? And incompetence, right? And who wants to come from a school that's been associated like that when they're trying to get jobs? As you know, our state and county sponsors contribute about two-thirds of our operating revenue. And they have explicitly told me that they want to give us more money. But it's their impression that we mismanage public funds. And that makes sense, right? Individuals and organizations and companies that we can partner with in terms of internships, in terms of developing cutting edge programs, in terms of corporate or individual donations to the college, right? People do not want to back a loser, right? So, the University of Southern California, for over 100 years, they've collected data on the correlation between the record of their football team and the amount of money they bring in from advancement. So the president invites people to watch the game and then they have a dinner afterwards. If the team wins, people write checks, right? It only makes sense. People want to back a winner. Non-tuition revenue is very important to us. And unless people have faith, individuals, companies, corporations, our county, right, have faith in us, they're not going to want to, to be associated with us. Talent, skilled individuals, when we're looking for people to fill openings at the college, they will not want to be here, right? Who wants to work for that organization? And keeping talent is also an issue if we have a reputation of incompetence, right? And all of us are less inspired and committed to work here if we have the same impression, right? And so there, there's a vicious spiral. Less talent, less commitment, poorer impression. Less talent, less commitment, poorer impression. So one of my priorities as president is image renewal. By focusing on touch points. What are touch points? Simply put, it's how most of the people come in contact with us. So Jack Quinn has this old chair, the big chair, that I'm now sitting in. He's had it for nine years, and the stuffing is coming out of the cushions, right? So I asked for a new chair, so the office company sends in this $900 office chair. And the leather on the back and the seat, luxurious. I mean, you just want to curl yourself into it. So I sit in it. And I put my hands on the armrest, cheap plastic, right? Grainy, hard, cheap plastic, right? 
Now my back and my butt will never touch that sweet leather, right? But my hands, my wrists, and my elbows will be constantly rubbing up against that cheap plastic, right? They could have sold me that chair for a hundred bucks if they just reversed the order. Put that nice leather on that thin strip of armrest, right? And the plastic on the seat in the back, right? So the idea of touch points is realigning our resources for where most people have contact with the college. And where is that? Facilities, right? We have state senators coming here for conferences on opiate addiction. They walk through that front door that has cobwebs, is rusted out. You could see, right? They're afraid to get tetanus by touching that door. <laughs> right? Now, we don't have to paint the ceiling of the fifth floor bathroom. We might realign the resources for where 90% of the people experience our campus, right? The front doors, the bathroom on the first floor, right? Those hallways. The website, our number one marketing tool, is the second most impactful vehicle that we have in terms of how people interact or come in contact with us. Communications, right? We have such wonderful stories about our programs, our faculty, our staff, and our students. But we don't even know about them ourselves. So someone who works here at the college didn't know that we provide free classes. We have a clinic that provides free eyewear for people who can't afford it. We don't even know our own stories. So part of my mission is to get the stories out. And rebrand the college. Because as I've suggested, image is so important in terms of people's confidence and support for us. Now rebranding sounds like a very sophisticated thing. It really isn't. A brand is merely the sum total of people's experience of that product or service, right? And so we've seen, for instance, with United Airlines, how one incident could tarnish a brand. But the opposite is that one positive act by you will help improve our brand. So whether you spend a little extra time with someone filling out their FAFSA, their financial aid application, whether you spend a little more time on someone's paper and giving them feedback about their grammar, these things all help improve our brand. Rebranding often includes a new logo. And so this is one that um, our marketing team came up with. I think Jerome did this himself. Um, Yay. So this will be one of many options for you to vote on. So students are in a contest creating a new ECC logo. In a few weeks, you will all have a, some say as to what logo will best represent us. OK, so a brand is more than a logo. And unless it's evidenced, unless it's evidenced with a, something different, a change, an improvement in service or product, that logo will not make a difference, right? And one of the surprises in terms of my coming here is how much oversight there is, how many stakeholders there are and how different their vision is of the college and how different their interests are. So there's the state of New York. There's SUNY. There's our board members. There's faculty. There's a few thousand staff. We have five unions. 
three campuses with individual identities. So how do we align all these disparate interests? Students first, right? This is the one principle on which we should all align our work, our passion, and our creativity. So every decision that we make should be based on students' interests first and from the perspective of the student. Now, given, given how, how desperate we are in terms of resources, how do we focus on students first in a way that we can improve student success? It's no different than aligning resources for facilities, right? Touch points. You may have heard this story. Um, one of the best ways to improve tuition revenue isn't getting new students. The best way to improve tuition revenue is keeping the students you have, right? And so, I'm implementing a program called Imprinting, based on the, the work of Nobel Prize laureate Conrad Lorenz. Now, you may have seen some black and white film footage of Conrad walking around his farm in rubber boots with a dozen ducklings following him around, right? And he coined this term called imprinting to describe what happens when you reach a young duckling at that critical developmental period for them, when you create that emotional bond with that duckling, they will treat you as their mother, right? And they'll follow you around the rest of their lives. So, the idea in terms of retention is to have our most committed faculty and staff provide high touch and high tech to those students in the first term, the first week, the first day of their experience to create that emotional bond that will allow them to tolerate the ups and downs of college life that will allow them to seek help when they need help. The other thing, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to. I also want to align people's passions to students, right? So you will all have conversations with your supervisors in terms of what you're doing. I want you to be motivated, committed, and inspired in what you're doing. And if you're not, then we'll find a way for you to channel your passions in another capacity, right? And so we want to hear from you how you think you can best serve students. Where do your passions lie? If you're not passionate about what you're doing, it doesn't do anything for our students. It doesn't do anything for us, the college, and it doesn't do anything for you, right? So it's another way where it doesn't cost us anything to align you with your passions in serving students. Technology. So everyone hears about disruption. And technology plays a big role in that. So I, I just moved here from Seattle. I rented my house. I sent the lease by PDF, by email, to this young man who works for DocuSign. He sent it back to me. DocuSign is a software program that allows people to legally execute a contract. I have a copy, he has a copy. Nothing touched paper, nothing. We edited on a Word document, we created a PDF, we signed 
with DocuSign. Imagine how many industries are disrupted by this technology. People who plant trees, people who cut down trees, people who move trees to the pulp and paper mill, people who work for pulp and paper, people who make photocopiers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All those jobs wiped out by this one technology. We can also harness it for student success. So I've used Facebook as a learning management system for courses and for student support. And so for instance, in student support, we had one advisor between 12 and 16 students. And so students would ask questions of financial aid about when a course is going to start. And often, students answered other students. So that created a community and a cohort, emotional ties with other students, which, which is also another predictor for student success. But that technology allowed us to have students from all across the world. It didn't cost us anything, so there was cost savings. And we were able to use it to have fewer advisors. Right? And there's a, there's a great group that is looking at open resource education, which is something that I believe is critical for our students. Because our students do not have the discretionary income to pay hundreds of dollars for textbooks. And so this, this idea is to use information, resources that are open to everyone, right? You could get a PhD just looking at TED Talks, right? You would never have to step into a classroom. So imagine if we go this route in an aggressive way ECC, no textbooks, right? That could be our tagline. <laughs> Again, these things do not cost us anything. Anticipation. So anticipating problems before they arise, technological or otherwise, um, I think is critical for our student population. Because by the time they walk out the door, meaning they've left the college, it's really hard to get them back. And so, perhaps we can begin to anticipate the gaps in service and learning that will inevitably happen to our students, right? Before they leave the institution. And that is, part of creating a new culture. What is culture? Culture is merely a set of values, a set of experiences, a set of beliefs and constructs that shape people's lives. And it's like the air we breathe. You're unaware of it until you experience a different culture. And so, I experienced this change when I moved from the East Coast. So I used to live in Nova Scotia. And I moved to California, right? And that change in culture was palpable. Let me talk a bit about East Coast culture. So Buffalo is considered East Coast, but the true East Coast is right here. It's east, it's on the coast, and it's east of Maine, right? So I worked as a clinical psychologist going to fishing villages. So just some context, the fisher people, actually I can say fishermen because they were all men, the fishermen in these villages were experiencing depression, chemical dependency as a result of a 10-year moratorium on cod fishing because they had overfished the Grand Banks. 
And so this is the only thing these men knew, right? There had been eight generations in any family of fishermen before them, eight generations. They've eaten the same food for eight generations, fish and potatoes. Their fishing techniques were exactly the same as their great, 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 great grandfathers, right? That is tradition. Tradition, from the Latin trans, across, dare, to, to give, the act of giving across, giving across generations. There are two meanings that come from tradition. Cross, giving, also means betray. And so the original Latin tradition is used in two different, very different ways. But I think it's very appropriate because tradition does give and it can also betray, right? It gives us a convention, a lifestyle, prepackaged. We don't have to think about it. But it also betrays us in that it may close us to other possibilities. So when I reached the West Coast, one of the more dramatic things I saw was that people are not as tied to tradition. It's all about the newest, the greatest. It's all about innovation. It's all about new ideas. Wherever they're from, it doesn't matter, right? And so having come from Nova Scotia, where tradition was so strong, and by the way, Nova Scotia stands for New Scotland, just like we have in the US, New England, that they revered their tradition so much that they would call their new place of home a reference, a homage to the old country, right? So is it a coincidence that the innovation seems to be coming from the West Coast, whether it be Uber eight years ago, the legalization of marijuana, or Amazon delivering your packages by drone in not two days, but two hours, right? Now, why is there such a cultural difference about change, about newness, right? Two theories. One is that if you imagine those people that came from England, the Puritans, right? Black hats, hosiery, buckles on their hats. The ones that settled in New England, started farms, grew corn, squash, some of those people didn't want to stay there, even though food was abundant, right? And their future was predictable, season after season. You plant your crops, you reap your crops. There were groups of people that felt they needed to go west. Now, Imagine yourself being one of them. Would you be the ones to stay or would you the, be the ones to get in your carriage and walk into the unknown? So I think there's something in these people's DNA that they're more adventurous, that they're risk takers, right? And then there's a little boy in the corner of that picture. It might be a girl. What? sort of learning, what sort of tr tradition, cultural learning is he getting if he is coming across with his parents and his parents say, I don't know what's across those mountains, but it doesn't matter, we'll survive. And it might be better than what we've had before. That's a completely different attitude about difference, about change, about the unknown, about new ideas, right? And so those people that sailed on the West Coast, what happened then? Those people who might have been genetically predisposed to risk taking and culturally informed by risk takers in their own family. 
Well, they hit up against the Pacific Ocean, right? And they get exposed to Asian culture, right? People who eat food with sticks, people who don't believe in God, right? Could you imagine how that would expand your thinking? Whereas the people who stayed, right? People with the black hats and the tr buckles on them, well, their nearest culture of contact, apart from their own, across the waters was the old country. How to make sauce, right? So that's the first theory. The second theory is that on top of that predis predisposition to adhere to tradition, because your family tells you how important tradition is, is that for the past three generations, so for the past 75 years on the East Coast, so in Cleveland, in Pittsburgh, in Detroit, in Buffalo, the last 75 years, what has change meant? It meant loss. It meant loss of a job. It meant loss of your home. It meant loss of income. Right. So if you learn that, if you grew up here, it only makes sense that you're a little squeamish about change. Right. Everyone you know and every personal experience you've had, change has meant something devastating. Why would you want change? It totally makes sense. But we know you need to change to survive. Learned helplessness. So this is a psychological term, right? They did experiments on dogs. So they put them in a cage and they chalked them. And so the dogs there were multiple conditions. One, one, is, one is if the dog jumps over this barrier after being shocked, the shock would stop. If the dog jumps over the barrier within three seconds, when a light comes on, the shock isn't administered, right? So you imagine that dog in that condition when he or she first gets shocked, it's doing everything it can. It's running around the cage. By accident, it finds out, oh, when I see that red light coming, which precedes the shock, and I jump over this fence, this barrier, I don't get shocked. So you guess what happens the next time the dog sees that red light, it jumps over the barrier, it doesn't get shocked. Unfortunately, there's another experimental condition in which regardless of what the dog does, it gets shocked, right? And so, the first few times you see that dog running around trying to do everything it can, right, to get out of that cage, it soon realizes after a few days it can't do anything. It has no agency to change its condition. It just lies down and gets shocked, right? I think the impact of three generations in which Change has meant devastation, right? Creates a learned helplessness about whether we have any ability, any capacity or agency to change our conditions. That that is part of the cultural belief system. And naturally so. So, what is the new ECC? The new ECC is really a new attitude. It's really a new attitude. So this is a depiction of learned helplessness. So when this, when this elephant was a young elephant, when it was strong and courageous, it was tied by a metal shackle, right? And it would yank at that shackle with all its might, tear at that shackle day after day, right? So its leg would start bleeding, right? But then it realized soon that it doesn't help. Whatever I do, I can't get away from the shackle. After the first year, 
you can tie that elephant with a thin rope. Learned helplessness. The new ECC, for me, is releasing ourselves, liberating ourselves from the learning of the past. So I ask you, you know, what is it that we are being tethered to? What beliefs, right? What associations, what memories, what experiences are we tethered to that no longer reflect the current reality, right? I think the new ECC is about transforming ourselves first in releasing ourselves from those mental chains. I think change is natural. And that what it provides for us, I think personally, is an opportunity to fully realize our individual potential, right? And the college to actualize its potential. that unless we embrace change, right, we stay at a immature stage of our best selves. And the college stays at an immature stage of its best self. So as some of you know, I'm an academic by training and I still publish. I have a 2010 publication on synchronicity. Um, you can find it on academia.edu. Synchronicity was a term coined by Carl Jung. He stole it from the Chinese that had had it for millennia. Um, in a nutshell, it suggests that our inner lives, what happens internally for us, our deepest desires and thoughts, and things we can see, the external world, events that happen to us, are intimately connected. There's no barrier between your personal desires right, and what takes place in the world. Right? And that the forces of the universe are such that they gravitate towards your wholeness and everyone else's wholeness, collectively, right? The trick, the trick of synch synchronicity is that it consists both of conscious and unconscious desires and behaviors, right? It's difficult to know what our un unconscious is thinking or doing, by definition. The part that we do play a role is in our conscious activities, right? how we think about ourselves. I believe our unconscious, our unconscious is motivating us towards growth and the fulfillment of our individual potential. Sometimes our conscious actions don't necessarily help us in that direction because of what we've learned and what we've associated with things of the past. So uh, I did Canadian Peace Corps in West Africa and this was a common saying. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And so I really believe synchronicity works, that it's a way in which all our desires are interacting right now, right? Whether we're conscious of them or not. And the forces are working towards mutual wholeness and mutual fulfillment. That that is the natural, natural gravitational pull for us to become whole, for us to become our best selves. The key to unlocking that potential 
is being conscious of the ways in which we prevent ourselves from reaching our potential, that we prevent each other from reaching our potential. I think we owe it to our students, and most importantly, I think we all owe it to ourselves. So, this is a possible new brand for us to focus on Erie so people can't say Easy Credit College. Um, and to focus on redefining Erie, redefining who we are in terms of things that we know we can be. Efficiency, relevancy, innovation, entrepreneurship. So, just to reiterate, just to wrap up, we have an image problem. It's clear. I don't want any prospective student crying anywhere because they think that we're the only place they can go. Right? We can address both the image and our students by aligning our current resources more intelligently. And aligning your passions more intelligently. Metamorphosis, right? Change, natural change. That requires a conscious openness. Because of who we are as human beings, we can choose not to change even if it's for our own good. So you know what I used to do? I used to put a very sharp coffee table, right? A little side table, right in the middle of my room. Why? Because I would bump up against that thing in the middle of the night when I'm running to pick up something. I forget it's there. But I did that because I needed to have some mechanism by which I could be shaked out of my routine, my patterns of thinking, right? my habits. Metamorphosis. So as we see, things naturally change as part of their development. Any birth, however, or rebirth, sometimes requires inconvenience or pain, right? And so I think we need to embrace or at least accept that that is part of the process for us to realize our own potential and for the college to realize its potential. So as I said, efficiency, the new image of us, relevance, Innovation, entrepreneurship, right? So I want to be known as the college that tries new things, that innovates, that we are the center of innovation, right? We're doing this with Sun City. So we don't have people on assembly lines making steel girders, right? We're making solar panels to make the earth a better place, right? Entrepreneurship, we have relationships with businesses and companies and organizations in such a way that we can create another stream of revenue. We provide placements for our students, right? We make the most of our assets. We're relevant again for Western New York. As far as I'm concerned, right, the growth of Buffalo and Western New York is closely tied to what we do with our students, right? We provide the workforce in Western New York. That's a huge responsibility. Efficiency, right? We're managing public funds. That we have to do so in a judicious way. And the more we do that, the more money we'll get, right? It's a kind of ironic. It spells I am eerie, which is what I want you to feel. I want you to feel that ownership, that responsibility and that agency, that I can make a difference to shift our brand in that little thing I do, 
in everything I do. In that conversation I have with someone in my backyard, that starts to shift people's perception of us. Legacy. Legacy is something you bequeath to someone else, as in a will. So, a couple weeks ago, I was driving from Seattle to Buffalo, and uh, I was looking at places to visit along the way. And someone suggested you should go to Mount Rushmore. So I looked up Mount Rushmore and I said, someone contrived this so that it would attract tourists to South Dakota. I mean, why else would you go to South Dakota? <laughs> right? So this was, a, this was a marketing plan. This was a scheme. This was just an idea to draw people in. Right? There's nothing sacred about it. But I decided to go anyways. Because I'm a sucker for these things. So I go, right? And it so happened, and here is a warning. If you go in the middle of July, you will be in traffic with 700,000 Harley riders. <laughs> because Sturgis right, has an annual Harley convention every summer. So that's, <laughs> you can learn from my mistake. So I eventually get there after following a few thousand Harley drivers. And I'm blown away. I'm completely blown away by the majesty of this monument. Right? Two things. I think it's an app metaphor. It's an app metaphor for the college that what you do every second of every day somehow shapes something that will last beyond your time. Right? Because this was not made overnight. 400 people, 14 years made this. It's also an apt metaphor for what we do with our students. We shape them, we mold them, we sculpt them. Right? Our legacy is the quality and character of our students. That's our legacy. So I'll leave you with one question, which is, what legacy do you want to leave at ECC? <laughs>